Hi, welcome to Scorpion Maps Ultimate CA M8 revision video. In this video, we're going to look at the CA M8 topics, so the M8 topics from the CA GCSE Mavs course. If you are revising for M8, it's very, very important that you look at the M7, M6, and M5 topics as well. Make sure you're really confident with those, as well as being familiar with M1, M2, M3, M4. So this is the M8 revision video. In this video, we're going to spend about five or so minutes going through every single one of the topics. So in red, you've got the number topics. In green, we've got the geometry of the shape, space, and measure topics. In orange, we've got the statistics or the probability topics. And in blue, we've got the algebra topics. And I'm going to spend about five or so minutes on each of these topics today to make sure you're familiar with each one of these topics. If you do need any extra help beyond this video, I'd highly recommend going to corporatemavs.com forward slash contents. And there you'll find a list of all the videos and worksheets we've got in Corporate Mavs. And beside each one of the topics, if you do need any extra help, for instance, if you needed some extra help on fractional indices, if you scroll down to video 173, you'll find a video tutorial dedicated to just fractional indices as well as practice questions and textbook exercises that'll be perfect to give you some extra practice on those. But the idea of this video today is to make sure you're familiar with all the topics that are on the M8 course. Also, as you're watching the video, you may want to make some notes on each of the topics as we go through. But also, you may want to try some questions. And I've created the ultimate CA M8 revision question booklet. <laughs> Catchy title, I know. But in that booklet, you've got a question on every single one of the topics in order of the video. So as you go through the video, there'll be questions there. There's a link to it in the description below. And also on the front of the booklet, there's a QR code that you can scan to see the answers. So that might be really useful for you as well. There's a link to the Corbin Mavs revision cards in the description below, but they're really useful. And I borrow quite a few of them as we go through this video. So if you've got them, they can be really useful as part of your revision. And also, as part of your M8 revision, rather than leaving your revision to the last minute and cramming, I'd highly recommend a little and often approach. So spending five or so minutes, five, ten minutes every single day doing some Mavs revision will have a big impact on your confidence going into M8. And for M8, I'd highly recommend the higher five days and the higher plus five days, and they're the green and blue books on Corbin Mavs. Okay, so let's get started. So our first topic is Irrational Numbers, and this is video 230 on Corporate Maths. And an irrational number is a number that cannot be expressed as a fraction. So for instance, something like pi, which is 3.14159 and so on, the decimal part of that number doesn't have a pattern, so we can't convert it or change it into a fraction. It's irrational. Whereas some numbers, such as 0 0.544444, you'll see later on in this video, we can convert that into a fraction. So that would be a rational number whenever you can express it as a fraction. So here's a typical question. It says, circle the rational numbers. So here we've got some rational numbers and we've got some irrational numbers. And some of the topics later on the video may help you with this one actually um, I'm just going through this because in the M8 list this is one of the first number topics listed so we've got the square root of 11 if you do the square root of 11 on your calculator you'll, you'll see that the answer is 3.316624479 and so on it doesn't have a pattern therefore we can't express it as a fraction so that is an irrational number and actually, whenever we're dealing with square roots or thirds, whenever the number underneath the square root isn't a square number, so like for instance 9, and if you had the square root of 9, that's 3, whenever it's a number that's not a square number, the answer will be irrational whenever you work out the square root of it. So square roots are still often irrational, except for whenever the number underneath it is a square number. So that is an irrational number. The square root of 11 is irrational. Okay, next one, 0.54 with a little dot above a 4. That is actually the number 0.5, and because it's got a dot above the 4, it means the 4 carries on, so that would be the number 0.54444, and so on. We can actually write recurring decimals as fractions, so that is rational, so it's not irrational. Next, we've got the square root of 32 divided by the square root of 2. Now, again, later on in this video, we're going to look at thirds, and whenever we're dealing with thirds, there's a rule of thirds that you can actually divide thirds by each other. So the square root of 32 divided by the square root of 2 would be whenever you do 32 divided by 2 it's 16 so the answer would be the square root of 16 and the square root of 16 is 4 so that's rational okay our last one our last one's 3 pi well pi is irrational and whenever we times it by 3 the answer would be on my calculator would be 9.42477961 and so on that's still irrational so 3 pi is an irrational number so that is irrational so we'll circle that one as well and that's it Okay, so our next topic is recurring decimals and converting recurring decimals to fractions. So let's look and see how we would do that. And that's video 96 in Corporate Maths. So we're going to use algebra to write this recurring decimal as a fraction. So here's our recurring decimal, 0.0262626 and so on. It could be written as 0.026 with a little dot above the 2 and a little dot above the 6. That would also be the same thing. And we're going to look at how to write this as a fraction. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to let this be called x. So we're going to write x equals 0 0.0262626 and so on. Okay, so that's x. That's our recurring decimal we were given in the question. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at our number, our 0.0262626266 and so on, and look at the bit that's recurring forever. So that is our 26, it goes 262626 and so on. So we want to find a number where we have the decimal point and then we've just got that recurring bit, 262626266 and so on. Now if we multiply this number by 10, what that would do is move all our digits one column to the left. So 10x, if we wrote down 10x, that would be equal to, if we multiply this by 10, we would get 0. and then that would be 26, 26, 26, and so on. And that's going to be really useful for us. Now what we're going to do is we want to get another number when we get 26, 26, 26, 26. If we go back to our original number, if we multiply this by, well, if we multiply it by 10, that's 10x. If we multiply it by 100, we would have 2.626262. Well, that's not what we want. We want 26, 26, 26, 26. So let's try multiplying x by 1,000. So let's write 1,000x. So if we multiply this by 1,000, we would get, well, moving all the digits three places to the left would give us 26.262626 and so on. So we multiply that by 1,000. So what we've done is we've taken our x and we've multiplied it by 10 to get 0 0.2626262626 and so on. And we've also gone back to our x and we've multiplied it by 1,000 to get 26.2626262626 and so on. Now what's really fantastic here is if we subtract these from each other, our 26.2626262626, and we take away 0 0.2626262626, the parts after the decimal point will cancel out. So let's write that down and see what we get. So let's write down our 10x and then equals 0 0.262626 and so on. And when we take these away from each other, we get, well, on our left-hand side, we've got a 1,000x take away 10x. Well, a 1,000x take away 10x will be 990x, so 990x. And on our right-hand side, well, we had 26.262626, and we take away 0 0.262626. And if you have a look, take away 6 is 0, 2 take away 2 is 0, 6 take away 6 is 0, 2 take away 2 is 0, 6 take away 6 is 0, 2 take away 2 is 0. So we would just have, so all those numbers after the decimal point would just cancel out. So we'd just be left with 26 take away 0. And 26 take away 0 is 26. So whenever you take 26.262626 and you take 0 0.2626 away from that, you'll just be left with 26. So we've got 990x equals 26. Now remember, we let the number we started with in the question be x. So what we want to do is we want to solve this equation and find out what x is. So if we divide both sides of this equation by 990, we'll find x. So divide by 990 and divide by 990. And that gives us, on the left-hand side, x. And on the right-hand side, we would have 26 over 990. And that's it. So we have written our 0 0.0262626 as a fraction, as 26 over 990, and that's it. Now, we could sometimes in the question be asked to cancel it down. So if we were asked to cancel this down, well, we can see, first of all, that both of these numbers are even, so we can divide both of them by 2. So that would give us, well, 26 divided by 2 is 13. And if we divided 990 by 2, we get 495. And then finally, 13 and 495 don't have any common factors apart from 1, so that means that that's it. We've simplified it as far as we can. And that's it. So that's how you write a recurring decimal as a fraction. You let the original recurring decimal be called x. You then try and find either 10x or 100x or 1000x or whatever, where you've just got the recurring bits after the decimal points, and then you take them away from each other, and then you just solve that equation, and that'll be how you write a recurring decimal as a fraction. So just before we go on and look at fractional indices, I want to recap negative indices, because in M8, we're going to have to look at negative fractional indices as well. So negative indices is video 175 in Corbett Maths, or also remember it was in the M7 video. So if you watch that M7 video, it's in there as well. So if you get a negative power, we can just put one over the positive power. So if if we had 2 to the negative 4, that'll be the same as 1 over 2 to the power of 4. So we can get rid of the negative power and just put 1 over. Next, let's work out 2 to the power of 4. Well, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So that would be 1 over 16. So 2 to the power of negative 4 is 1 16th, just doing 1 over the positive power. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So our next question is 11 to the power of negative 2. So again, if we've got a negative power, we can put 1 over and then 11 with just the positive power to the power of 2. So we've got 1 over 11 squared. 11 times 11 is 121. So that should be 1 over 121. And that's it. So that's negative indices. Now let's look at fractional indices. Okay, now let's have a look at fractional indices. And that's video 173 in Corporate Maths. So if we have something like x, and we've got a power of 1 over n, so perhaps it was x to the power of a half, or x to the power of a third, or x to the power of a quarter, or something like that, that is equal to the nth root of x. 
So for instance, if you had x to the power of a half, that would be the square root of x. If you had x to the power of a third, that would be the third root or the cube root of x. If you had x to the power of a quarter, it would be the fourth root of x and so on. So whatever the denominator is on the fraction, that's what root you take off the base number of this x. And that's how you deal with fractions where you've got a 1 on the numerator. If there's another number on the numerator, such as x to the power of m over n, so what you do is whatever's on the denominator of the power, you take that root. So you're going to take the m root of x. And then whatever's on the numerator, you then work out that power. So whenever you've got a fractional indice, what you do is whatever's on the denominator, you take that root. And whatever's on the numerator, you then do that power. And the rule looks really complicated, but it's much more easier whenever we look at numbers. So let's have a look at the revision card and let's get started. So if we had something such as 25 to the power of a half, so the power of a half means square root. We don't need to worry about the ones, so we can just square root it. So 25 to the power of a half, we just square root the 25, which is 5. If we had a power of a third, such as 8 to the power of a third, well, again, because there's a 1 on the numerator, we just need to look at the denominator. Because it's a 3, we're going to take the cube root, and the cube root of 8 is 2. So 8 to the power of a third is just 2, because you take the cube root. Okay, now let's have a look at some of the numbers on the numerator. So if we had something like... 27 to the power of two thirds. Well, we're going to look at the denominator to begin with, and it's a three. So we're going to work out the cube root of 27, and the cube root of 27 is three. And then you're going to look at the numerator, and it's a two, so you're going to square that answer. So three squared is nine. So 27 to the power of two thirds would be nine. And finally, if we had something such as 16 to the power of three quarters, Again, you look at the denominator, and it's a 4, so we're going to take the 4th root of 16. Well, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16, so that's going to be 2. And then you're going to look at the numerator, which is a 3, and you're going to do 2 cubed, which is 8. So whatever's on the denominator, you take that root, and then whatever's on the numerator, you then do that power. Okay, let's have a look at some examples. So first question says, work out 16 to the power of a quarter. So here we've got 16, and we've got a power that is a fraction. So this is a fractional indice. And what's good about it is it does have a 1 on the numerator, so we just need to work out whatever root's on the denominator. So it's going to be the fourth root. So we need to work out the fourth root of 16. So that's the fourth root of 16. Now 16 is equal to 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. And as you can see, whenever you've got four twos and you multiply them all together, we get 16. So that means that the fourth root of 16 would be 2. So that means that 16 to the power of a quarter is equal to 2. And that's it. So 16 to the power of a quarter is equal to 2. Okay, this time we've got 4 to the power of 5 halves. So again, we've got a power that's a fraction. And this time we do have something on the numerator but other than 1. So we are going to need to work out that power. But first of all, we're going to look at the denominator and it's a 2. So we're going to work out the square root of 4. So you're going to do the square root of 4. And the square root of 4 is equal to 2. Now you take that answer, that 2, and we're going to do 2 to the power of 5. So 2 to the power of 5. And then whenever you do that, you get 2 times 2 times 2 times, we can have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. And well, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, we know is equal to 16. And times by 2, again, that's going to be 32. And that's it. So 4 to the power of 5 halves is equal to 32. Because you take the square root, which is 2, and then do that answer to the power of 5. Okay, next one is 125 to the power of 2 thirds. So we're going to look at the denominator, and it's a 3, so we're going to work out the cube root of 125. So let's work out the cube root of 125 to begin with. And the cube root of 125 is 5, because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. So the cube root of 125 is 5. Now we're going to look at the numerator, and that's a 2, so we're going to do 5 squared. And 5 squared is equal to 25. So 125 to the power of 2 thirds is equal to 25 by taking the cube root and then squaring it. Okay, now we've got our negative fractional indice. So we're putting together our negative indices and our fractional indices. So we've got 49 to the power of minus a half. So first of all, because it's a negative power, we're going to write 1 over and then 49 to the positive power. So that's just going to be to the power of a half. So 49 to the negative of a half, I would write that as 1 over 49 to the power of a half. Now, to the power of a half means square root, so we're going to square root 49, and the square root of 49 is 7. So answer would be 1 over 7. So if you had 49 to the power of negative a half, it would be equal to 1 over 7. And finally, if we had 64 to the power of negative 2 thirds, again, I would write it as 1 over 64 to the power of 2 thirds, getting rid of that negative power and writing it as 1 over 64 to the power of 2 thirds. Then we're going to take the cube root of 64 and then square it. So the cube root of 64, 
the cube root of 64 is equal to 4, because 4 times 4 times 4 is equal to 64. And then we're going to square it. So we're going to take our 4 and we're going to square that, and that's equal to 16. So 64 to the power of 2 thirds is equal to 16. So we had 1 over that, so it's going to be 1 over 16, and that's it. So we wrote 1 over 64 to the power of 2 thirds, and then we worked out what 64 to the power of 2 thirds would be, which is 16. So the answer is 1 over 16. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is growth and decay. And here's a typical question. It says the population of an island at the beginning of 2018 was 50,000. And each year the population increased by 2%. Work out the population of the island at the beginning of 2023. Give your answers to the nearest 100. And in a question like this, we can use the compound interest formula. We can use the initial times multiplier to the power of time. And that'd be really useful in a situation like this because we're increasing by 2% each year. So first of all, our initial, the population initially was 50,000. So we're gonna use 50,000. And then we're gonna multiply that by the multiplier. Well, it's a 2% increase. So that will be as a multiplier 1.02 because you're increasing by 2%. You're going from 100% to 102%. So as a multiplier, that would be 1.02. And to the power of time, well, between 2018 and 2023, that's five years, and it's increasing at 2% per year. So we've got five years, so it's going to be to the power of five. So that's it. So we're going to work out 50,000 multiplied by 1.2 to the power of five. And when we do that, we get we get an answer of 55,204.04 and so on. Then the question said, give our answer to the nearest 100. So to the nearest 100, our answer would be 55,200. And that's it. And this compound interest formula can be really useful whenever you're dealing with situations that involve growth. So whenever things are getting bigger, such as this, an increase of 2% each year. Or decay, so that might be whenever things are getting smaller. So whenever your multiplier will be a 0 point something number. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is SIRDS. And this is video 305 to 308 on corporate maths. You may have encountered SIRDS in M7. Because in M7, we were asked to write things exactly. And whenever we looked at the Pythagoras question in that video, we left our answer as a square root of, I think it was 83. And so rather than writing it as a decimal number, we left it as a SIRD. And this, it's a much tidier way of writing that answer. And whenever we're dealing with SIRDS, there's laws of SIRDS. So if you're multiplying two SIRDS together, such as the square root to 3 multiplied by the square root of 5, you can just multiply those to get the square root of 15. So the square root of 3 multiplied by the square root of 5 is the square root of 15. So if you've got two thirds, you can multiply them together. And that also works even if you've got numbers in front of them. For instance, if you had 3 root 2 multiplied by 2 root 5, you can multiply the numbers at the front. So 3 times 2 is 6. And then you can multiply the thirds. Root 2 times root 5 is root 10. So the answer would be 6 root 10. So you can multiply thirds together. If there's thirds without numbers in the front, so if it's just root 3 times root 5, you can multiply them to get root 15. Or if you're multiplying thirds with numbers in front of them, such as 3 root 2 multiplied by 2 root 5, you can multiply the numbers in front first of all to get 6, and then you can multiply root 2 by root 5 to get root 10. Okay, next. If you've got root a times root a, the answer is just a. So for instance, if you had root 7 times root 7, well, root 7 times root 7, looking at the law above, would be root 49, because 7 times 7 is 49. And remember, the square root of 49 is just 7, so the answer would be 7. So if, so if you had root 7, multiply by root 7, the answer would just be 7. Root 2 times root 2 would be 2, root 10 times root 10 would be 10, and the reason is root a times root a is equal to a. And also, we can divide thirds as well. So for instance, if we had root 6 divided by root 2, we just do 6 divided by 2, which is 3. So the answer would be the square root of 3. And also, that works with numbers in front as well. So for instance, if we had 12 root 14 divided by 3 root 2, we can divide the numbers in front to begin with. A bit like algebra, we can do 12 divided by 3, which is 4, so 4. And then we could do the square root of 14 divided by the square root of 2, which would be the square root of 7, so it would be 4 root 7. And that would be it. So these are the laws of thirds, and they're very important. So you can multiply thirds together, you can divide thirds, and also if you've got something such as root a times root a, it's just a. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, we've looked at our rules. Now let's look at how we can simplify some thirds. So if we had something such as the square root of 200, if you type that into your calculator and press the square root of 200 and press equals, you'll find it comes up as 10 root 2. So it doesn't come up as the square root of 200, it comes up as 10 root 2. Whereas if you press the square root of 10 and press equals, it would just come up as the square root of 10. And that's because some thirds can be simplified and some thirds can't be simplified. So here we've got a third that can be simplified, the square root of 200. 
So what you do is you consider what's the biggest square number that you can divide 200 by. Now the biggest square number that I can divide 200 by is 100 because 200 divided by 100 is 2. I can divide 200 by 100. So I'm going to write down the square root of 100, that biggest square number, multiplied by the square root of 2. Now what's fantastic is if you've got a square number, you can work out the square root of it. And the square root of 100 is 10. So we've got 10 times the square root of 2. And in so, it's a bit like algebra, we tend not to write the multiplication sign. So instead of writing 10 times root 2, we just write 10 root 2. And that means 10 lots of root 2. And that's it. So if we want to simplify a third, you look for the biggest square number you can divide it by, and then you split it up into two thirds times in together, so the square root of 100 times the square root of 2. You square root the square number, and then you just put them together. Let's have a look at another one. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So we're going to simplify the square root of 75. So what we're going to do is look for the biggest square number we can divide 75 by. So let's write down our square numbers. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and so on. Now, I'm not going to go any further because we've gone past 75. And we're looking for the biggest number, the biggest square number we can divide 75 by. Well, 1, well, that's not going to actually help us because we'd end up with the square root of 1 times the square root of 75. So that's not actually going to simplify out 4. Well, 4 is not a factor of 75. 9 is not a factor of 75. 16 is not a factor of 75. 25 is because 75 divided by 25 is 3. 36, 49, 64, and 81 are not factors. So 25 would be the biggest square number that is a factor of 75. So let's write that down. The square root of 25 multiplied by the square root of 3 because those two were multiplied together to give us 75. Now we can square root of 25, the square root of 25 is 5, so that'll be 5 times the square root of 3. And then again, we tend not to write that multiply sign, so the answer would be 5 root 3. And if you got your calculator and typed in the square root of 75 and press equals, you should get 5 root 3. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic, and that's adding thirds. So whenever we want to add thirds or take thirds away from each other, we want to simplify them, and then hopefully we can add or take them away. So let's have a look at our first example. We've got the square root of 18 plus the square root of 8. So let's start off with the square root of 18. So the square root of 18 would be equal to, well, let's consider the biggest square number that's a factor of 18, and that would be 9. So we'd have root 9 multiplied by root 2. And the square root of 9 is 3, so that would be 3 times root 2, or 3 root 2. So instead of root 18, we're going to write 3 root 2, because that would simplify to 3 root 2. And root 8, well, the biggest square number that's a factor of 8 is 4, so we're going to write root 4 multiplied by root 2. And squaring the 4 would give us 2 root 2. So root 8 would be 2 root 2. So we've got instead of root 18 plus root 8, we would have 3 root 2, or 3 lots of root 2, plus 2 lots of root 2. And that's great because we're now dealing with just root 2s. And if you had 3 root 2s and you added 2 root 2s, altogether that would be 5 lots of root 2. So the answer would be 5 root 2. And that's it. Okay, this time we've got root 75 plus 9 root 12. So let's start off with our root 75. That would be root 25. That's the biggest square number that you can divide 75 by. Multiply by root 3. And the square root of 25 is 5, so it would be 5 root 3. So it's root 75 is 5 root 3. And then in terms of our 9 root 12, let's deal with our root 12 to begin with. So root 12 would be, well, the biggest square number we can divide 12 by would be 4. So it would be root 4 multiplied by root 3. And the square root of 4 is 2, so that would be 2 root 3. And here we didn't just have our root 12, we had 9 root 12, so that means 9 lots of root 12. So we're going to multiply this by 9, so we're going to multiply the number 2 by 9, so that will be 18 root 3. So we've got 5 lots of root 3, plus 18 lots of root 3, so altogether that would be 23 lots of root 3. So root 75 plus 9 root 12 would be 23 root 3. So sometimes with thirds we're asked to expand and simplify brackets that involve thirds. So here we've got 3 minus root 2 close bracket squared. And whenever we've got a bracket squared, it means to multiply it by itself. So let's write the bracket out beside itself. So 3 minus root 2, close brackets, 3 minus root 2, close brackets. And we're going to multiply this by itself. So we're going to do 3 times 3, which is 9. So that's equal to 9. Then we're going to do 3 times minus root 2. So it's going to be minus. And when we're multiplying a whole number by a third, we can just put them together. So 3 times root 2 would be 3 root 2. Or in this case, it's going to be minus 3 root 2. Then we've got minus root 2 times 3. Again, putting them together would be minus 3 root 2. And finally, we've got minus root 2 times minus root 2. Well, negative times a negative is a positive, so plus. And then you've got root 2 times root 2. Now, that could be root 4, but remember the square root of 4 is 2, so the answer just there would be 2. So now we need to simplify. So let's look at our whole numbers. We've got 9, and then we've got plus 2. Well, 9 plus 2 is 11, so we're just going to write 11. Now looking at our thirds, we've got minus 3 root 2 
take away another free root 2, well, altogether, that'd be minus 6 lots of root 2. So that'll be minus 6 root 2. And that's it. OK, let's have a look at our next topic. OK, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is rationalizing denominators. Now, maths, we tend not to like to have irrational numbers on the denominators of fractions. So, for instance, something like 10 over root 2. We tend not to like to have that because we've got an irrational number, root 2, on the denominator. So whenever we've got a fraction such as 10 over root 2, we are sometimes asked to rationalize the denominator. And what that means is get rid of that root 2 on the denominator. Now, whenever we're dealing with fractions, we can multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the same thing, and we get an equivalent fraction. So for instance, if we had 10 over root 2, we can multiply these both by 4 or by 9, and you would get an equivalent fraction. But what would be really great is that whenever we choose our number, that whenever we multiply both the numerator and the denominator by it, that we can turn this denominator into a rational number. Now remember, if you've got something like root 2, you can do root 2 times root 2, and that would give you 2, because root 2 times root 2 is equal to root 4, which is 2. So if we multiply both the numerator and the denominator of this fraction by root 2, what we will do is we will get rid of this root 2 on the denominator. So whenever we do that, we get 10 times root 2 is equal to 10 root 2. And then on the denominator, we would have root 2 times root 2, which is root 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. So that we would get 10 lots of root 2, 10 root 2, divided by 2. And that's fantastic because we have rationalized the denominator. We have changed our irrational number, our root 2, into a, a rational number. Now, something like this, you can actually simplify it a little bit further. If you had 10 root 2 and you divided it by 2, you would get 5 root 2. And that's it. Okay, so if you had something like 4 over root 3 and you were asked to rationalize the denominator, what you do is you multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the third on the denominator, this root 3. So multiply by root 3 and multiply by root 3 and let's see what we get. 4 times root 3 is 4 root 3. And on the denominator, root 3 times root 3 is root 9, which is 3. And that's it. So we would have 4 root 3 over 3. And again, this is great because we have rationalized the denominator. We have changed our root 3, our irrational number, into a rational number. So if you're asked to rationalize the denominator where you've just got a third on the denominator, you can just multiply both the numerator and the denominator by that third. Let's have a look at another one. OK, our next fraction is 5 over 4 root 3. Now on this one, it's a little bit different because it's not just root 3 on the denominator, we've got 4 root 3. Now we've got a choice here, we could multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 4 root 3 if you wanted to. I personally just multiply it by the third part, I'm just going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by root 3, and let's see what we get. So we multiply by root 3 and multiply by root 3. 5 times root 3 is just 5 root 3. And on the denominator, we had 4 root 3, and we multiplied it by root 3. Well, if we had 4 root 3 and multiplied it by root 3, that would give us 4 times the square root of 9. And the square root of 9 is 3, so we would have 4 times 3, and 4 times 3 is equal to 12. So if you had 4 root 3 and you multiplied it by root 3, you would get 4 times 3, which is 12. And that's it, so we have rationalized the denominator. And we can't cancel this down because 5 twelfths can't be cancelled down, and that's it. Now, in terms of rationalizing the denominator, in M8, the examples they give in terms of the fractions that you need to rationalize the denominator for are a bit like the one we've just done. Now, there are slightly harder rationalizing the denominator questions, and these aren't actually mentioned on the specification, but if I was teaching my class, I would just point out how to do one. So if, for instance, you were given a question such as this, rationalize the denominator of 3 over root 2 plus 1. Now, if you're given something like this, okay, and you want to rationalize the denominator, what we've got to do is multiply both the top and the bottom by what we call the conjugate of the denominator. And what that means is, because we've got root 2 plus 1, if we want to rationalize the denominator, we need to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by root 2 minus 1, root 2 minus 1. And if we multiply both the numerator and denominator of this fraction by the conjugate of root 2 plus 1, what that means is change the plus sign to a minus sign. And if we multiply both the numerator and denominator by that, we will rationalize the denominator. Let's have a look and see what we get. So with the numerator, we would just get, well, 3 times root 2 minus 1 would be 3 bracket root 2 minus 1. And then on the denominator, we would have root 2 plus 1 bracket root 2 minus 1, close brackets. So let's expand our brackets. The numerator expanding that would give us 3 root 2 minus 3, multiplying both of these by 3. And in terms of the denominator, let's expand these brackets and see what we get. So if we had root 2 plus 1, bracket root 2 minus 1, if we expand these brackets, we'll get root 2 times root 2 is 2. Root 2 times minus 1 would be minus root 2. 1 times root 2 would be plus root 2. And then finally, 1 times minus 1 would be minus 1. And when we simplify that, we get 2 minus 1 is 1. 
Then we've got minus root 2 plus root 2, well that's 0. So the answer would just be 1. So on our denominator we would have 1, and that is rationalised, 1's rational. And then finally, because we can divide both of these by 1, our answer would just be 3 root 2 minus 3, and that's it. So if you do get a fraction where you've got a third and then a number, or a number then a third, then what you do is you multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. And what that means is the same expression, but if it has a plus sign, put a minus sign, or if this had a minus sign, put a plus sign. Now I do think questions like that would be unlikely in MA. It's just that in the specification, the examples they give are examples such as this format. But uh, I would still teach that to my class because not only is it good practice for expanding brackets, it will also help them prepare for A-level and so on, just so that they can know how to rationalize expressions where you've got a third and a number on the denominator. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is inverse proportion, and that's video 255 in corporate maths. In M7, we looked at direct proportion. We're now going to look at inverse proportion. And what that means is, as one value gets bigger, the other value gets smaller. So here's our example. We've got t is inversely proportional to the cube of bell. So let's write that down. We've got t is inversely proportional. So we write t is proportional. And because it's inversely, we put 1 over. And then we put whatever it says next on the denominator. So it says t is inversely proportional to the cube of l. So we do l cubed. So here we've got t is proportional to 1 over l cubed. So if it says inversely proportional, you do the proportional sign and you put 1 over. And that's it. So that's our statement. We've got t is proportional to 1 over l cubed. And then we're given some important information. We're told whenever l is equal to 0 0.2, t is equal to 5. And we've been asked to find the formula connecting t and l. So whenever we had direct proportion, we wanted to get rid of this proportional sign and we put in k. So what we're going to do is we're going to write t. And then what we'll do is we'll get rid of this. So we'll put in equals. And whenever it's inversely proportional, we're going to put our k in, in the numerator. OK, so we'll have k over l cubed. The reason is we've multiplied this by k. And whenever you multiply this by k, the k will be on the numerator. Now we're told some information. We're told whenever l is equal to 0 0.2, so whenever l is equal to 0 0.2, t is equal to 5. So let's substitute those in. So we've got 5 instead of t equals k, which is what we want to find out, over l cubed. So that's going to be 0.2 cubed. Let's work out what 0.2 cubed is. So 0.2 cubed is 0.008. Now we want to get k on its own, so we don't want this to divide by 0.008. So what we're going to do is multiply both sides by 0.008. So we'll multiply both sides by 0.008, multiply by 0.008. And when we do that, we get, on the left-hand side, 5 times 0.008 would be 0.04. On the right hand side, we had k divided by 0.008. We times by 0.008 to get rid of that, so we're just left with k. So k is equal to 0.004. So the question says, write down a formula connecting t and l. So if we go back up to here, we're told that t is equal to k over l cubed. Now we know that k is equal to 0.04, so that means we're going to have 0.04 over l cubed. And that's our formula that connects t and l. t is equal to 0.04 divided by l cubed. Next, we're asked to work out the value of t whenever l is equal to 0 0.5. So that means that t is equal to 0 0.04 divided by 0 0.5 cubed. And when we work that out, we get t is equal to 0 0.32. So we substituted our value for l, our 0 0.5, into our formula, and we find that t would be equal to 0 0.32. Okay, next. Next, we're asked to find the value for l whenever t is equal to 2. So let's write down our formula again. We've got t is equal to 0 0.04 divided by l cubed. And we're told that t is equal to 2. So we're going to have 2 equals 0 0.04 divided by l cubed. So let's solve this. Let's multiply both sides by l cubed. So we would get 2l cubed is equal to 0 0.04. Next, we want to get the L on its own, so let's get rid of the 2. So let's divide both sides by 2, so we'll get L cubed equals 0 0.02. And then finally, we want to get the L on its own, so we want to get rid of this cube. So let's cube root both sides. So L is going to be equal to the cube root of 0 0.02, which is equal to... And we get L is equal to 0 0.27144 and so on. Or let's just run that to two decimal places, so that's going to be 0 0.2722 decimal places. And that's it. So whenever you're doing inverse proportion questions, you want to make sure that whenever you put the proportional symbol in, because it's inverse, it's going to be 1 over, and then whatever comes next in this statement. And then whenever you get rid of the proportion symbol and put in the equal sign, then you put the k in on the numerator, and then you can just solve the questions quite nicely. 
Another thing I want to show you then is the proportionality graphs. So we've already looked at y is proportional to x, so this graph in M7. And we've looked at y is proportional to x squared, so this graph starting at the origin and curving upwards like the x squared graph. And we've also looked at y is proportional to the square root of x, so it would start at the origin and then curve like this. Well, whenever we get something such as y is inversely proportional to x, the graph will look something like this, where it starts up quite high. Remember, as one value gets bigger, the other value gets smaller and it'll curve downwards like so. Okay, our next topic is negative scale factor. So we're looking at enlargements and we're looking at how to enlarge things with a negative scale factor. So whenever you enlarge by a negative scale factor, what happens is the points move in the opposite directions. So let's have a look at our question. So here we've got a square and it's drawn on our grid and we've been asked to enlarge by scale factor negative four using negative three, negative one as the center of enlargement. Let's mark on that center of enlargement. So that center of enlargement will be here, negative three, negative one. And we're now going to enlarge each of these points. So let's start off with this point here. Okay, so to get from our center of enlargement to the point, we would move one square to the left. So if we're enlarging by negative four, what that means is instead of going one to the left, we're going to go four to the right. So we're going to go one, two, three, four. So that point will move there. Okay, our next point, so this point here. So this point here was one, two to the left from our center of enlargement. So instead of going two to the left, we're going to go eight to the right. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's going to move to here. So we've done these two points, now let's choose this point here. So this point is one to the left and one down. So we're gonna go four times as far away, but in the opposite direction. So we're gonna go, instead of going one to the left and one down, we're gonna go four to the right and four up. So one, two, three, four, and four up. One, two, three, four will be here. Okay, and finally, our point down here, the bottom left-hand point of our square, it's one, two to the left and one down. So instead of going two to the left and one down, we're going to go four times as far away, but in the opposite direction. So instead of being two to the left, it's going to be eight to the right. And instead of being one down, it's going to be four up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and four up. One, two, three, four. So we've now got our four points, we just need to join them up. And that's it, we've enlarged this square by scale factor negative four using negative three, negative one as the center of enlargement. And whenever you're enlarging by negative scale factors, it's enlarged, but it goes in the opposite direction. And that's it. And if you want more practice on this, it's video 108 in corporate maths. And also remember, you've got those practice questions and textbook exercises beside that number. And also remember, there's that bumper packer question. So if you do look at the booklet in the description below and open it up, there'll be a question there on negative scale factors. Okay, next topic. Our next topic is a sine rule. So the sine rule is really useful whenever you want to find out missing angles or missing sides on non-right angle triangles. Because with right angle triangles, we can use basic trigonometry. So the skipped over, two old angels skipped over heaven carrying a harp. But whenever you've got triangles that aren't right angles, the sine rule is really useful. And here's part of the corporate mass revision card. So if you've got a triangle such as this, where you've got capital A, capital B, and capital C being the angles, and then you've got the opposite sides being little a, little b, and little c, the sine rule is a over sine a would be equal to b over sine b which is equal to c over sine c so the sine rule is really useful whenever you know a side and the opposite angle such as this triangle here we've got a side nine and we've got the opposite angle 85 degrees so that's going to be really useful in this question so let's use the sine rule to work out the sides of x this missing side so the sine rule is a over sine a equals b over sine b so what that means is we've got x over sine 45 so x over sine 45 because they're opposite each other will be equal to nine over sine 85. So nine over sine 85. So we've got our x divided by sine 45 and we've got that's equal to nine divided by sine 85. So if I do nine divided by sine 85 in my calculator, that gives me x over sine 45 will be equal to 9.0343 and so on. And I keep that on my calculator display. I'm just gonna write it on the page like this. Now, I wanna find what x is. So I don't want this sine 45 on the denominator. So if I wanna get x on its own, I wanna get rid of the divide by sine 45. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by sine 45. So multiplying the left-hand side by sine 45 will just leave me with x. On the right-hand side, I'm gonna have my 9.0343 and so on, and it's still in my calculator display. And then I'm gonna type in times sine 45. So if I just press times sine 45 my calculator and press equals, I get x is equal to 6.388 and so on, or I could round this to two decimal places and I could round it to x equals 6.39 to two decimal places. And I should put in my units, which is centimeters. And that's it. So the sine rule, it's really useful, particularly if you've got a side and the opposite angle. And that is that a over sine a will be equal to b over sine b. 
And you can use it to find missing sides, like this example, or we can use it to find missing angles, like our next example. So in this case, we've got our side and our opposite angle, we've got our 35 centimeters and our 80 degrees, and we've got our 16 centimeters and our vita. And the sine rule is A over sine A equals B over sine B equals C over sine C. Now, one thing you can do is, whenever you're doing missing angle questions, rather than using A over sine A, you can actually flip it over and write sine A over little a will be equal to sine B over little b, and that's equal to sine C over little c. So if you are finding angles, it can be useful to actually flip over the formula and to write it the other way around. So sine A over little a equals sine B over little b equals sine C over little c. Now if we have a look at our triangle, we do have an angle on the opposite side, and we're trying to find another angle, and we've got its opposite side. So we can write that down. We could write sine vita, what we're looking for, vita, sine vita over 16, will equal sine 80 over 35. Sine 80 over 35. Now we can do sine 80 divided by 35 in our calculator, so that would give us 0 0.02813 and so on, and the calculator display carries on, and I just leave that in my calculator. And that gives us that sine vita divided by 16 is equal to 0 0.02813 and so on. Now I don't want this divided by 16, I just want the vita on its own, so let's multiply both sides by 16. So let's multiply by 16 and multiply by 16. And when we do that, on the left hand side we'll just be left with sine vita, and on the right hand side, we're just going to press on our calculator, we've, we've still got this on our calculator display, so we're just going to press times 16 equals, and we get 0 0.45019 and so on. Now we found what the sine of the angle is, the sine of the angle is equal to 0 0.45019 and so on. But we don't want the sine of the angle, we want to know what the angle vita is. So we want to get rid of the sine, so we have to do the inverse, so that's going to be the inverse sine when we press shift sine. So we'll press, we'll write down vita equals sine to the negative one, the inverse sine of 0 0.45019 and so on. Now we've still got this in our calculator display, so if we just press shift and then sign, we get our sine to the negative one, our inverse sine, and then just press ANS on our calculator, so we'll just type in this sine negative one, so shift sign and then press the answer button, and then press equals, and it will give us the answer of theta equals 26.756 degrees and that's to three decimal places, and that's it. So we have used the sine rule to find the size of this missing angle. So the sine rule is A over sine A equals B over sine B equals C over sine C, and that version of the formula I use a lot whenever I'm finding missing sides, because the side's on the numerator, and if I'm finding the missing angle, I flip it over and write sine A over A equals sine B over B equals sine C over C. And the sine rule is particularly useful whenever you've got an angle and a side opposite each other, and then you're trying to find a side or an angle. Okay, so we've looked at the sine rule, now let's look at the cosine rule. Okay, so we've looked at the sine rule, let's now have a look at the cosine rule. And the cosine rule is video 335 and 336 in Corbett Maths, and here's part of the Corbett Maths revision card. And we've got our cosine rule here, which is A squared, so we've got this triangle, and we've got A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos A. So in other words, if you have got a side, another side, and an angle between them, you can find the length of the opposite side. So here we have got a side and a side and the angle between them, and we can find the length of this opposite side. So we, if we wanted to find this value, what we would do is we would do 20 squared plus 15 squared minus 2 times 20 times 15 times the cos of 120. And that would tell us the value of this value squared, and then you'd square root it. So let's do that now, let's find the value of x. So we have got the cosine rule, which is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So we've got our two sides and we've got the angle in between them. So the little a will be the side opposite the angle. So this means that little a will be x, so we'll write x squared equals. Now b and c doesn't actually matter which way around these go, so we're just going to write 20 squared plus 15 squared. And then we've got minus... And then we've got 2bc cos a, and I tend to write this in a bracket, so I tend to put a bracket down and do 2 times b, which is 20, times c, which is 15, times the cos of a, and that's the cos of 120, so cos of 120, close brackets. Okay, next, let's work this out, so we've got x squared equals, and then on our calculators we can type in 20 squared, which is 400, and then 15 squared, which is 225, and then we've got minus, and then let's type this in our calculator and see what we get. So 2 times 20 times 15 times the cos of 120. And whenever I do that, I get that's equal to negative 300. So our answer to that was negative 300. And let's close brackets around that. So we've got x squared is equal to 400 plus 225 minus negative 300. 
Now let's work out what we get. So x squared equals, so 400 plus 225 minus minus 300 is equal to 925. So this side is not 925 centimeters. It wouldn't make sense for this question because that's x squared. So we need to square root it to find the value of x. So x will be equal to the square root of 925, which is equal to 30.414 centimeters. So answer will be 30.414 centimeters to three decimal places. I've rounded out the three decimal places and that's it. So the cosine rule is really useful whenever you've got two sides and the enclosed angle and you're trying to find the length of the other side, the one opposite the angle. And that's the cosine rule formula. The cosine rule can also be really useful if you have a triangle and you know the length of the three sides, you can work out the size of one of the angles. But just remember that little a is opposite capital A. So whenever you're trying to find the angle, so cos A, little a will be the side opposite it. And the B and C, it doesn't actually matter which way around they go. So that could be B and that could be C. So let's substitute those values into the cosine rule formula and work out the size of this missing angle A. So the cosine rule is A squared. So remember the little a and the capital A are opposite each other. So A squared, so in this case the A will be 7. So 7 squared is equal to B squared plus C squared. So B and C will be 8 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times B times C times cos A. So, times, so 2 times B, which is 8, times C, which is 5 times the cos of a. So in this case, a is vita, so the cos of vita. So let's work this out. So we've got 7 squared is 49 equals 8 squared is 64 plus 5 squared, which is 25. And then we've got minus 2 times 8 times 5 times cos vita. Well, 2 times 5 is equal to 10 times 8 is 80. And then so that's 80 cos vita, multiplying the numbers in front of the cos vita together and then just putting the cos vita after it. So let's simplify this. So we've got 64 plus 25, that's gonna be 89. So we've got 49 equals, 64 plus 25 is 89 minus 80 cos vita. Now we wanna get the cos vita on its own, so let's get rid of this 89. So let's minus 89 from both sides, so minus 89 and minus 89. And 49 take away 89 will be equal to negative 40 is equal to, and with the 89 take away 89 is zero, so we'll be left with negative 80 cos vita. I've got a couple of options of things I can do here. I could divide both sides by negative 80, and that would give me negative 40 divided by negative 80 equals cos vita. Well, one thing I like to do is if I've got an equation where I've got things both being negative, I can multiply both sides by negative 1. 40 times negative 1 is 40, and negative 80 cos vita times by negative 1 is 80 cos vita. Now I'm just going to divide both sides by 80 to get what cos vita is. So divide by 80 and divide by 80. So 40 divided by 80 is 0.5. And on the right hand side, 80 cos vita divided by 80 just leaves us with cos vita. So that means that the cos of this angle is 0.5. We don't want to know the cos of the angle. We want to find the angle, so we need to do the opposite. So we're going to do the inverse cos of 0.5, and that will give us the size of our angle. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 60. So that means that vita equals 60 degrees. So vita equals 60 degrees. And that's it. So the cosine rule can be really useful to find missing angles as well as missing sides. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is finding the area of a triangle using trigonometry, and that's video 337 on Cobra Maths. So the area of a triangle is found by a half AB sine C, where A and B are two sides, and capital C is the angle in between them. So if you have a triangle such as this one, if you want to find the area of this triangle, we can do area equals a half times the two sides, so 14 times eight times, and then the sine of the angle in between them, so the sine of 70. And when we do that on our calculator, we get we've got a half multiplied by 14 multiplied by 8 multiplied by the sine of 70. You get that's equal to 52.623 centimeters squared to three decimal places. So I've rounded that to three decimal places. And also because it was an area question, we've got our units of centimeters squared. And that's it. So if you want to find the area of a triangle, and if you know two sides and the angle in between them, you can just do a half AB sine C. So next topic now is to have a look at 3D Pythagoras. So this is whenever we're dealing with Pythagoras in three dimensions. So here we've got a cuboid, and we've been asked to find the length of AG. So the length of AG is from A going up diagonally all the way up to G. So let's find the length of this line AG, this diagonal going from one corner up to the opposite corner. 
So if we want to find the length of this line, well, let's have a look and see what we've been given. So we've been given the length of the cuboid is 6, we've been given the width is 2, and the height is 3. So look, let's start off by looking at the base of this cuboid. So the base of the cuboid is a rectangle. We've got 6 and we've got 2. So if we turn this base into a right angle triangle, we can find the length AC. And that's going to be very important because we know this is a right angle triangle. So if we know what this is, and we've got the 3, we can then find the length of AG. So let's find the length of AC to begin with. So AC squared, this is a right angle triangle here, it's a cuboid. So we've got AC squared is equal to 2 squared plus 6 squared. So 2 squared plus 6 squared would be equal to AC squared, using Pythagoras. So that would mean that AC squared is equal to 2 squared is 4, and 6 squared is 36. So we've got AC squared would be equal to 40. So that means that AC would be equal to the square root of 40. Now in these questions I tend not to want to square them, I like to work with thirds because you're going to see in a minute we're going to square this again so that makes it easier if we don't actually use decimal numbers and we use our exact answer. So we find the distance from A to C is equal to the square root of 40. So we've got this distance, now if we look at this triangle ACG, this is the right angle triangle also, where this is our right angle there. So we know that AG is going to be the hypotenuse, it's the longest side, and our AC and our CG are our two shorter sides. So that means that AG squared, AG squared is equal to AC squared plus CG squared. So substituting in our values, we've got AG squared is equal to AC squared, so that's AC which is the square root of 40 squared plus CG squared will be 3 squared. Now let's work this out, so we've got AG squared will be equal to, now if you've got the square root of 40 squared, that means the square root of 40 times the square root of 40, now considering thirds, that will be equal to 40, because root A times root A is A, so root 40 squared is 40, plus, and then 3 squared is 9, so we've got that's equal to 9. So we've got AG squared is equal to 49, oh this is great. Now we just want to find AG, so we want a square root, so we've got the square root of 49, which is equal to 7. So that means that from A to G would be equal to 7 centimetres, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is 3D trigonometry. So as well as doing Pythagoras in three dimensions, we also know need to know for Emmy at how to do trigonometry in three dimensions. So here we've got a cuboid, and we've been asked to find the size of angle AC, or ACE. So we've got ACE. So that's going to be the angle if we go from A to C, there, and then we're going to go from C up to E, so that's going to be this way. The angle we want to find is this angle in here. Let's call this angle X. So we want to find this angle in here. Now if we want to find this angle, we're going to need to know some of the lengths of the sides of this right angle triangle. So you can see AC is a right angle triangle, and we need to know the lengths of some of the sides to be able to find the size of that angle. Two sides would be useful. So if you notice, CG is equal to 3. The height of the cuboid is 3 centimeters. So that means that AE will also be equal to 3 centimeters. That means now we need to either find the length of EC or AC, and then and that means we can use trigonometry to find the size of this angle. Let's find the length of AC. So here we've got on the base, we've got our ABC, and this is a right angle triangle as well, where we've got our two shorter sides of six centimeters and two centimeters. And this length, this diagonal will be the hypotenuse. It'll be the longer side in this right angle triangle. So let's write that down. AC squared equals, and we've got AB squared plus BC squared. So it's gonna be equals six squared plus two squared. Now six squared is 36. And 2 squared is 4, so we've got AC squared is equal to 36 plus 4. So that means that AC squared will be equal to 40. And if we square root, we get AC is equal to the square root of 40. So we've got the length of this line going diagonally from A across the C will be equal to the square root of 40. Now we've got this triangle ACE, and I tend to like to draw a sketch of it, so let's draw a sketch of that triangle. And let's label what we've got. So we know it's a right angle triangle. We know the height from A to E is 3, so we've got that's equal to 3 centimetres, so A, E, and then C's down there. We're trying to find this angle X down there, we've got that's equal to 3, and we've got A to C being the square root of 40. So that is our triangle, where we've got A, E, C, A, E, C, we've got 3 centimetres, the square root of 40, and we've got our X. Now if we have a look at this triangle, we're now going to use basic trigonometry to find the sides of this angle X. So we've got our 3, that's our opposite, so we're using our, let's consider our triangles, two old angels skipped over heaven carrying a harp. So we've got our opposite, we've got our hypotenuse here, and we've got the side down here, this is our adjacent. Now we're not actually using the hypotenuse, so we can cross that out, and we can cross out any triangle which has the H in it for hypotenuse. So to find the size of this angle here, this X, we're gonna use tan, we're using two old angels, so tan opposite adjacent.
We want to find the tan of the angle, so tan x is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. So the opposite is 3, and the adjacent is the square root of 40. So that's great. We now know that the tan of this angle is 3 divided by the square root of 40. So if we do the inverse tan, we will find the size of the angle. So the inverse tan of 3 over the square root of 40. And we can type that in on our calculator. So shift tan, the fraction button, 3, and then on the denominator of the square root of 40. And if we press equals, we get that's equal to 25.377 degrees to three decimal places. And that's it. So we have used trigonometry in three dimensions to find the size of that missing angle. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is similar shapes. And whenever we're dealing with similar shapes, remember the scale factor of enlargement for the sides is n, the scale factor for the area will be n squared, and the scale factor for the volumes is n cubed. So if we have a look at these prisms, prism A and prism B, pentagonal prisms. Pentagonal prism A, this prism has got a surface area of 300 centimeters squared whereas the surface area of B is 1,200 centimetres squared. Well, if we divide the surface area of B by the surface area of A, we can find the scale factor of enlargements for the areas. So if we divide 1,200 by 300, we get that's equal to 4. That means the surface areas are 4 times larger. So that means that our scale factor, our n squared, is equal to 4. That must mean that our sides were, if that's 4 times bigger, that means our sides, if we square root this 4, that means our sides will be 2 times bigger. So for instance, if that was 10 centimeters, that would be 20 centimeters. And to get the scale factor of enlargement for the volume, well, we cube this, so two cubed is eight. So if we know what the scale factor of enlargement is for the areas, in this case, we know it was four, we could square root that, which is two, and we can cube that then to find the scale factor of enlargement for the volumes. So we can then find out the volume of this larger prism by doing 600 multiplied by eight. And if we do 600 multiplied by eight, that's equal to 4,800 centimeters cubed. So that's great. That means if we know what the surface areas are, we can actually divide them to see how many la times larger the surface area is for the larger shape than the smaller one. We can then square root that, and then that'll tell us the scale factor of enlargement for the sides. If instead we knew the volumes, we could divide the volumes, and then in this case that would have been 8, and then we could cube root that to find the scale factor of enlargement for the sides, and then we could square it to get the areas and so on. And if you want to do more practice on this topic, you can watch video 293B on Cobra Mavs, and it will go through more examples of how to deal with questions whenever you're dealing with surface areas and volume. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is tree diagrams. And we looked at tree diagrams in M7, but this time we're going to be dealing with tree diagrams whenever objects perhaps are taken out and they're not put back in. So whenever the probabilities will change depending on what happens. Okay, so let's have a look at typical questions. So Kieran has seven blue pens. So blue pen, blue pen, blue pen, blue pen, blue pen, blue pen, blue pen. So we've got seven blue pens. And he has got three red pens. So he's got three red pens. One, two, three. So Kieran's going to pick a pen out at random. So he's going to pick one of these pens out at random. And it says we've got a replacement. So then he doesn't put it back in. And then he picks a second pen at random. And the question says, what's the probability that the pens are different colors? So here we've got a tree diagram. And we've got the first pen and then the second pen. Let's deal with the first pen to begin with, because we know that he's got seven blue and three red to begin with. So the probability of him getting a blue would be seven out of 10, so seven times. And the probability of him getting a red will be three out of 10, so three out of 10. So we've labeled our two probabilities to begin with. Now the second branches are gonna be a little bit more complicated because we're gonna to have to think about it a little bit. So he could have taken out a blue pen to begin with because he could have taken out a blue pen. And now we're gonna consider what the probabilities would be if he's taken out the blue pen. So let's get rid of a blue pen. So I've got rid of a blue pen, and let's now think of what the probabilities would be then for the second pen, if he took out the blue pen to begin with. So altogether, he's now got six blue and three red. So the probability of a blue pen, well, there's nine pens altogether, so there's gonna be nine, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six blue pens. So the probability of the second pen being blue would be six ninths. So if Kieran took a blue pen to begin with, the probability of the second pen being blue would be six ninths. If we took a blue pen to begin with and we want to know the probability of it being red, well, there's nine pens and one, two, three of them are red. So the probability of the second pen being red, if the first pen was blue, would be three ninths. Okay, so these are the probabilities if he took a blue pen to begin with. Now let's find the probabilities if he took a red pen to begin with. So let's put that blue pen back. So there's that blue pen back again. And if he took a red pen out to begin with, so let's get rid of one of the red pens. So he's taken that one out. And now let's find these probabilities. So he's taken out a red pen. What's the probability for blue pen now? Well, again, there's still nine pens because he's taken one of them out. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine pens. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He's still got seven blue pens in there because he took a red one out. So the probability for blue would be seven ninths. 
Well, they're probably for red. Well, if we took a red one out to begin with, there'd be nine pens, and there'd only be two reds now, so the probability for red would be two ninths. So we have now labeled the probabilities on the tree diagram, and as you can see, the probabilities change depending on what he does first. Now let's consider outcomes. So we could have a blue and blue, he could have a blue and a red, he could have a red and a blue, or he could have a red and a red. And to find these probabilities, remember we multiply the numbers along the branches. So for a blue and a blue, we would do seven tenths multiplied by six ninths. And that would give us seven times six is 42, and 10 times nine is equal to 90. So the probability for blue and a blue would be 42 ninetieths. The probability of a blue and a red, well, that would be a blue, seven tenths to begin with. And then we're going to multiply that by three ninths, so multiply by three ninths. And that would be equal to seven times three is equal to 21 over 90. Now the probability of a red and a blue, well, that would be three tenths multiplied by seven ninths. So multiply by seven ninths. Three times seven is 21, 10 times nine is 90. So that would also be 21 over 90. And finally, the probability of a red and a red, well, that would be three tenths times two ninths. And that would be equal to three times two is six, and 10 times nine is 90. So the probability of a red and a red would be six ninetieths. Now the question says, find the probability that the pens are different colors. So if we have blue and blue, that wouldn't work. They're both the same colors. If we had a blue and a red, that would work. So that probability is a good probability. That would work. A red and a blue, well, they're different colors as well. So that's another probability that we want to look at. And a red and a red wouldn't work. They're both the same color. So we want to consider these two probabilities. So see if we're going to be a blue and a red or a red and a blue. And remember in the or rule, if it's one probability or another one, we add them together. So we're going to do 21 over 90 plus 21 over 90, and that would be equal to 42 out of 90. So the probability that the pens are different colors would be 42 out of 90, or 42 90ths. Now normally with probability questions, you only need to simplify it if they ask you to, so if we simplify this at the very end, the answer would be 7 15ths, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is conditional probability, and that's video 247 on corporate maths. And here's our question. It says, inside a bag, there's two apples, so an apple and an apple, and there's three bananas, so there's three bananas. So in a bag, there's five pieces of fruit, there's two apples and three bananas. And Olivia's gonna pick out two items from the bag at random without replacement. So she's gonna take out two items, she's gonna take the first one out, she's not gonna put it back in, and then she's gonna take a second one out. And the question says, what's the probability of her picking two apples? So that's the probability of an apple and another apple. So probability of apple and apple, okay? So altogether, Olivia has five pieces of fruit in the bag. Now we want to find the probability of her picking an apple to begin with. So altogether, there's five pieces of fruit, two of them are apples, so the probability of that first piece of fruit being an apple is two-fifths. So that's the probability of the first piece of fruit being an apple, two-fifths. So now she's picked an apple, she's taken it out of the bag, and that now leaves her with four pieces of fruit in the bag. She's got an apple and three bananas. And we want to find the probability of an apple and an apple. So remember on that tree diagram, we want to find the probability of the first one being an apple, and then we're going to multiply it by the probability of the second one being an apple. But she's taken one of those apples out. So now altogether, there's four pieces of fruit in the bag, and she's only got one apple. So the probability of the second one being an apple will be one quarter. Now we've got our two probabilities, we can just times them together. Two times one is equal to two, and five times four is equal to 20. So the probability of Olivia picking an apple and an apple would be two twentieths, or we can cancel that down to one tenth. And that's it. If we were asked the probability of her picking two bananas, so the probability of banana and banana, we would do, well, to begin with, let's put that apple back in the bag. So let's put that A back. So if we were asked the probability of Olivia picking two bananas, well, first of all, there's five pieces of fruit in the bag and three of them are bananas, so it'd be three fifths. Then she would have taken out a banana, and then that would leave her with four pieces of fruit and two of them being bananas. So that would be the probably if the second one being a banana would be two fourths, so two quarters. So multiply by two quarters. And then we would just multiply them together. Three times two is equal to six, and five times four is equal to 20. And then we can cancel that down to be three out of 10. That's it. So whenever you're dealing with conditional probabilities, it's just very important to think about what the probability would be after the first thing has happened. So for in other words, after she's taken out the first apple, what was the probability of her getting that second apple? Likewise with the bananas, once she takes out that first banana, what would the probabilities then be of the second one being a banana and so on? Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is laws of indices, and that's video 174 in corporate maths. So we're going to use the laws of indices that we've looked at before. So for instance, if we're multiplying, we add the powers. If we're dividing, we take the powers away. And if we're doing a power of a power, we multiply the two powers together. 
But in M here, we're going to be doing those along with having fractional indices. So here we've got y to the power of two thirds multiplied by y to the power of a half. So here we've got the same base and we're multiplying, so we're going to add the powers. So let's do two thirds plus a half. So two thirds plus a half. And whenever we're adding these together, we want the same denominator. So that's going to be six and six. So here with two thirds, we'd multiply both of those by two so that we had six on the denominator. So two times two is four and three times two is six. So that's our equivalent fraction. And if we had a half to have six in the denominator, we would multiply both of them by three. So multiplying the numerator by three would give us three, and multiplying the denominator by three would give us six. So we've got four six plus three six. And if we add those together, the answer would be seven six. So that means that if we had y to the power of two thirds times y to the power of a half, we'd add the powers together, and the answer would be y to the power of seven six. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says y to the power of three and a half divided by y to the power of minus a half. So whenever we're dividing, we take away the powers. So we're going to do three and a half minus minus a half. Whenever we've got a minus and a minus beside each other, we're going to add. So we've got three and a half plus a half, which would be four. So that means our answer would be y to the power of four. And finally, we've got y to the power of 0 0.25 all to the power of seven. Here we've got a power of a power. So we're going to multiply the powers together. So we're going to do 0 0.25 multiply by 7, and our answer would be 1.75. So that means we'd have y to the power of 1.75. Alternatively, we could have considered the 0 0.25 as a quarter, so we would have a quarter multiplied by 7, and that would be 7 quarters, and 7 quarters is the same as 1.75. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is solving nonlinear simultaneous equations, and that's video 298 in Corporate Maths. So in MA, we may have to solve simultaneous equations such as this, where here we've got a nonlinear, this is a quadratic. Now, we may be asked to solve simultaneous equations and find the values for x and y, or we may be asked to find where a quadratic or a circle meets or intersects a straight line. And so let's solve these simultaneous equations. Now, there's two different ways to solve simultaneous equations, and we're going to look at two different examples in this video. So here we're quite lucky. We've got y equals x squared plus x minus 14, and we've also got y equals x minus 5. Now, if we've got two simultaneous equations where it's y equals and y equals, we can put them equal to each other. The reason is we know y is equal to this, and we also know that y is equal to this. So that means that we could write x squared plus x minus 14 equals x minus 5. So if they're both in the form y equals and y equals, you can just put them equal to each other like this. And then you can solve that and find their points of intersection or solve the simultaneous equations. So let's solve this. So whenever we're solving a quadratic, we want everything brought over to one side and zero on the other side. So let's bring everything to the left hand side here. So we've got x squared plus x minus 14 equals x minus 5. So let's get rid of this x. So let's take away x from both sides of this equation. So that will leave us with x squared x take away x is 0, so we've got then minus 14. And on the right hand side, we had x minus 5. We've taken away the x, so we're just going to be left with minus 5. Next, well, we want this quadratic to equal 0, so let's add 5 to both sides of this equation. So let's add 5 and add 5, and that will give us x squared. And then we've got minus 14 plus 5. Well, minus 14 plus 5 is going to be minus 9. And that's equal to, well, minus 5 plus 5 is 0. So we've got x squared minus 9 equals 0. Now, whenever you solve an equation like this, you could have something like this, something which is x squared minus 9. So that's going to be the difference between two squareds. Or you may have a quadratic that you may need to factorize. Or sometimes you might even need to use the quadratic formula. And a hint in the question there would be to find your answer to one or two decimal places. But in this case, here we've got difference between two squareds. We've got x squared and minus 9. So let's put bracket, 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 and then equal 0. We'll put x at the front of both brackets. And the square root of 9 is 3. So let's put 3 in both brackets, one with a plus sign and one with a minus sign. And then solving this, but well, we want to make each bracket zero. So in this bracket, it'll be x equals negative three or x equals three. So there would be our two solutions for x. But remember, we need to find our solutions for y as well for simultaneous equations. So let's substitute these back into one of our equations. And I do think this equation is much easier to substitute into the second one. So let's sub into y equals x minus five. So let's start off with x equals negative 3. So let's write an x equals negative 3. We would have y equals, and instead of x, we're going to have minus 3 minus 5. And minus 3 minus 5 would be minus 8. So y would equal minus 8. So that's one pair of solutions. x can be equal to negative 3, and y would be equal to negative 8. Or let's sub in x equals 3, and that would give us, we would have y equals, and then we've got x minus 5, so that's going to be 3 minus 5. And 3 minus 5 is equal to negative 2, so y would be equal to negative 2. So that's another pair of solutions. And that's it, so we've found our pair of solutions. So we've got that x equals negative 3 and y equals negative 8, or x equals 3 and y equals negative 2. 
And that's it, so our solutions are simultaneous equations. If you're asking this question to find where the quadratic y equals x squared plus x minus 14 and the straight line y equals x minus 5 intersect, then those would be our coordinates. We would have the coordinate negative 3, negative 8, and 3, negative 2. But this question was just a simultaneous equations question, so we've got our pairs of solutions. We've got x equals negative 3 and y equals negative 8, or x equals 3 and y equals negative 2. Now this time we've got our straight line. This is a straight line graph, something in the form y equals mx plus c. And this is a circle, and you'll see later on in this video that something in the form x squared plus y squared equals a number is a circle. So we've got a straight line and a circle, and we've been asked to find where this straight line and the circle will intersect. And that could be if you consider a circle and a straight line, they could not intersect, or they could intersect once, that means that the straight line would be a tangent, or the straight line could go through the circle and they would intersect twice. Now let's have a look and find the coordinates of the points of intersection. So this this seems to be that there would be two points of intersection here. And we're going to solve these simultaneous equations. Now this time we don't have a y equals and y equals. So this time we're going to use an approach called substitution. Because we know that y equals x plus 3. So in this second equation, this circle, this x squared plus y squared equals 149, we know this y is equal to x plus 3. So let's write that out. We could have x squared plus, and instead of y squared, we're going to put a bracket and write x plus 3, close brackets, squared, equals 149. So we've substituted this x plus 3 into here for the value for y. Now what we're going to do is expand our brackets, bring everything over to one side, hopefully it'll be a nice quadratic and we can solve it. That'll give us our values for x, and then we can substitute those back in to the top one and get our values for y. So let's do that. So we've got x squared plus, and then here we've got x plus 3 squared, so let's write the bracket out twice beside each other because we're multiplying x plus 3 by itself. That equals 149. Let's expand these brackets, so we've got x squared, and don't forget that x squared at the front, plus. Now we've got x times x, well x times x is x squared, then we've got x times 3, so that'll be plus 3x. Then we've got 3 times x, again that's going to be plus 3x. And finally we've got 3 times 3, that's equal to 9. And that's still equal to 149. Now let's simplify this left hand side. We've got x squared plus x squared, so that's going to be 2x squared. We've got 3x plus 3x, so that's going to be plus 6x. And then we've got plus 9, and that's equal to 149. Now, whenever we're solving quadratics, normally we'll want it to be equal to zero. So let's take away 149 from both sides of this equation. And when we take away 149 from both sides, let's see what we get. So the left-hand side, we would have 2x squared plus 6x. Now, we had 9, and we're taking away 149. So we're going to be left with minus 140. And that equals, and on the left-hand side, we get zero, because 149 take away 149 is zero. Now, we want to solve this quadratic. Now, as you may notice here, we've got 2x squared plus 6x minus 140. All of those terms are even, so let's divide this equation through by 2. And when we divide everything through by 2 here, we're going to get x squared plus 3x minus 70 equals 0. And if you've got an equation that's equal to 0, you can just divide all by 2 and get something. Hopefully, it's a bit nicer. Now, what we can do is we can factorize this left-hand side. So bracket, 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 bracket. Hopefully, this will factorize. If it doesn't, we're going to have to try something else, perhaps the quadratic formula. And we're going to put x at the front of both brackets. And we're going to think of two things at times together to give us negative 70. And then we'll add together to give us 3. Well, that's quite straightforward. That's going to be plus 10 and minus 7. Now, let's solve this. Well, we're trying to find when these are equal to 0. So that's going to be x equals negative 10 or x equals 7. So we find our values for x, now let's substitute those into the other equations to find our values for y. And the linear one's going to be the best one to choose here, we've got y equals x plus 3. So let's substitute those into y equals x plus 3, and let's get our values for y. So y equals, well if x is equal to negative 10, we're going to have negative 10 plus 3. Well negative 10 plus 3 is equal to negative 7, so y would be equal to negative 7. So that's our first solution, that whenever x equals negative 10, y equals negative 7. Or if x is equal to 7, well, y would be equal to x plus 3. So that's 7 plus 3, that's equal to 10. So there are our coordinates. We can write our coordinates. Well, x is equal to negative 10, so that's negative 10, negative 7. So that's our first coordinates where they will intersect. Or here, we're going to get 7, 10. So 7, 10. And that's it. So there are the coordinates where the circle and the straight line will intersect. They'll intersect at the coordinates negative 10, negative 7, and 7, 10. And that's it. So we've looked at solving nonlinear simultaneous equations. Now let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is exponential graphs. That's video 345 in corporate maths. So here's an example of an exponential graph where we've got y equals 2 to the power of x. And you may notice that the x is in the power. So that's why it's exponential. You've got a number, positive number, and you've got an x as the power. 
So let's have a look at our table of values. So if we had an XY table where we've got the values of negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, let's substitute those values of X in and find out what we would get. So if we had a power of 3, we would have 2 cubed, and 2 cubed is 8, so that means that Y would be equal to 8. If we had a power of 2, we would have 2 squared, and 2 squared is 4. If we had a power of 1, we'd have 2 to the power of 1, and that's equal to 2. Okay, our next one, whenever x is equal to 0, well, that's an important point because that's going to be the y-intercept. It's going to be where it crosses the y-axis. And 2 to the power of 0 is equal to 1. That's quite important because if it was y equals 5 to the power of x, it would be 5 to the power of 0, which would be 1. If it was y is equal to 10 to the power of x, that would also cross at 1. Even if it was y is equal to 0 0.5 to the power of x, 0 0.5 to the power of 0 is also equal to 1. So that's a very important point. It'll cross through the it'll cross the y-axis at 0, 1. Okay, next, whenever x is equal to negative 1, well, it's going to be 2 to the power of negative 1. That means we would have 1 over 2 to the power of 1. And 2 to the power of 1 is just 2, so the answer would be a half. So our next point would be negative 1, a half. And finally, if we had the value for x negative 2, we would have 2 to the power of negative 2. And that would be 1 over 2 squared. And 2 squared is 4, so that would be a quarter. That's it. Now, what's important to notice is if we had another point, if we had x equal to 4, well, that'll be 2 to the power of 4, which is 16. If we had 5, that'll be 2 to the power of 5, which is 32. And you may notice these values getting very big very quickly. And that's why you might have heard of the term exponential growth, because as the values for x just increase by 1 each time, you're going to get very large values, where it crosses through the points 0, 1, the y-intercept. It goes through the points 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, 4, 16, 5, 32, and so on. So the right-hand side of this graph gets very steep very quickly. And on the left-hand side, well, we're going to have minus one a half, minus two a quarter. And what happens is this graph approaches the x-axis but never reaches it. So it goes down like so, okay? So this is the graph of y equals two to the power of x. If you had a graph y equals 10 to the power of x, it'd look similar, it would still pass through zero, one, it would get steeper quicker on the right-hand side, and it would go just a bit shallower quicker on the left-hand side, but it would still just approach the x-axis, not meet it. If you had something in the form of y equals, and then something else such as 0 0.5 to the x, what would happen for that graph is it would actually be go the other way around. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is finding graphical solutions to quadratics, and that's video 267D. And these are slightly more complex than the ones we looked at previously. So here we've got the graph of y equals x squared plus 2x minus 3. And it says, by drawing an appropriate straight line, use your graph to find estimates to the solutions of x squared plus 2x minus 3 equals x plus 2. Now, whenever we looked at simultaneous equations earlier, like this one here, where we've got y equals and y equals, I mentioned that whenever you solve this, whenever you solved it, it would give you the coordinates of where they intersect each other. So if you had y equals something and y equals something, if you then solve those simultaneous equations, you find out where they intersect each other. So if we go back to our graph, as you may notice here, we've got our quadratic, our x squared plus 2x minus 3, on this left-hand side of the equation. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got x plus 2. So if we want to solve this equation, what we can do is we can draw the graph of y equals x plus 2 on this grid. And then if we find where they intersect each other, we can then go to the x-axis and find those values of x. And, and there'll be estimates because we're using the graph for it. So let's draw the graph y equals x plus 2. So we're going to use an xy table. And let's choose some values for x. So minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. And to find our y values, we're going to add 2. So minus 1, add 2 is 1. 0 add 2 is 2, 1 add 2 is 3, 2 add 2 is 4, and so on. So let's plot these coordinates. Now let's get a ruler and pencil and draw a line through those, a nice straight line through those points. And we've just drawn that straight line of y equals x plus 2. And if you notice here, we've got y equals x squared plus 2x minus 3, that left-hand side of the equation. And the right-hand side of the equation, we've got that x plus 2, that y equals. So we've got our y equals x plus 2 and our y equals x squared plus 2x minus 3. And we've drawn them on the graph, and we can see they intersect each other twice. So let's find where they intersect. So if we go down to our x-axis, so we've gone down to our x-axis. So between 1 and 2, we've got 10 little squares, and that's the 8th one. So it's going to be 1.8. And then if we look at the other one, they intersect here. So we go up to the x-axis. That'll be here, which is at minus 2, minus 2.5. That'll be minus 2.8. So our approximations, our solutions will be x equals negative 2.8 or x equals 1.8. And there are our estimates to our solutions. And that's it. So whenever you've got the quadratic equals something else, if you just draw that something else, as long as the quadratic you're given in the question drawn on the grid is the same as the one in the equation, if you just draw that other line and find where they meet each other and then go to the x-axis, you'll then find your approximations. 
Okay, let's have a look at a more complex one now. So we've got the graph y equals x squared minus x minus 2. So we've drawn for us is y equals x squared minus x minus 2. And the question says, by drawing an appropriate straight line, use your graph to find estimates to the solution of x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. But what we're trying to solve doesn't actually have x squared minus x minus 2. It's actually slightly different. It's got x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. But it does equal 0. If we were trying to find where a straight line intersects a quadratic, we would normally put them equal to each other. But you notice that this equals 0, so that means that whatever the linear was, we've taken it away from both sides to then leave us with x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. So if we take what we've been given, this y equals x squared minus x minus 2, and we write down what we've been given, with the 0 at the front, so 0 equals x squared minus 2x minus 1. If we take these away from each other, that will tell us the straight line graph we should draw. So let's take those away from each other and see what we get. So y take away 0 is y. So x squared minus x squared, they would cancel out. Then we've got minus x subtract minus 2x. Well, minus x minus minus 2x will mean minus x plus 2x. And minus x plus 2x would just be x. And then we've got minus 2, minus, minus 1. So whenever we do minus 2, minus, minus 1, we're going to add 1 on. So minus 2, add 1 would be minus 1. So that tells us we should draw the graph of y equals x minus 1. And we can check this. If we took the quadratic in the question, this x squared minus x minus 2, and we put it equal to x minus 1, and then if we take that away from both sides to make it equal to 0, hopefully we'll be left with this. So if we take away x from both sides, we'd have x squared minus 2x, because if you take away x from both sides, that would be minus x, take away another x, be minus 2x. And if we added 1 to both sides as well, we'd have minus 2 plus 1, which would be minus 1, equals 0. And as you can see here, then, that gives us that quadratic we're trying to solve in the question. So that's it. So if you're given a quadratic graph, y equals something, and you then ask to solve something which is slightly different and it equals 0, if you're at the 0 at the front and then take it away from the y equals, it will tell you what straight line to draw. So if we draw the line of y equals x minus 1, and we find where that straight line intersects y equals x squared minus x minus 2, it will give us our solutions for the quadratic we're given. So let's do that. So let's do our x, y table, x and y. And we'll go for 0, 1, and 2. And to find our y values, we're going to do x minus 1. So we're going to take 1 away from each of these. That'll be minus 1, 0, and 1. And let's plot those points. And that's it. So we've drawn the graph y equals x minus 1. And we want to find where that graph intersects the quadratic. So let's find the points of intersections. That's here. And it's also here. So if we look at this point, we've got, well, between 2 and 3, so this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 squares, that means we've gone up in point twos. so it's 2.2, 2.4, so this would be 2.4, and this point here would be, well, let's go down in point 2, so, so minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.4. So our two solutions would be x equals minus 0 0.4, or x equals 2.4, and that's it. If you do want to watch another video on that topic, video 267D on Corp Maths, we'll go through this in a bit more detail. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is rates of change, and that's video 390A on corporate Maths. So here we've got a question that says, below is the depth of water in a container over six seconds. So at zero seconds, the depth is just over 12 centimeters. At one second, it looks like it's about 12 centimeters. At two seconds, it's just above 11 centimeters and so on. And actually at six seconds, it's actually empty. It's the depth of the water at six seconds is zero. And the question says, estimate the rate of change of the depth of the water at 2.5 seconds. So we've got the point at 2.5 seconds. So this is the depth of the water at 2.5 seconds, which looks like it's about 11 centimeters. And we've been asked to find the rate of change of the depth of water at that time. So the gradient of this graph at that particular time will be its rate of change. But obviously this is a curve, so we can't just do rise over run because obviously it's curving. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a tangent at that particular point. So let's draw a tangent. So we've just drawn the tangent to the curve at 2.5 seconds. And if I find the gradient of that tangent, that's going to be the same as the gradient of the curve at that particular time. So that would tell us the rate of change of the depth of water at 2.5 seconds. So let's find the gradient of this tangent. So let's find two suitable points on that tangent to find the gradient. So let's start up with this point here. So we've got 0. And then if we look at where it meets the y-axis, it meets the y-axis at 1 square down. Altogether, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 little boxes that make up 2. 2 divided by 5 is 0 0.4. So this is going to be 0 0.4 below 14, so that will be 0.13.6. So that's one particular point on the tangent. So let's go for another point on the tangent. I'm going to go for this one here, which is at 4 seconds. 
at four seconds, the tangent passes through the second, the first square below 10, so it's going to be 9.6. So we've got two suitable points, two points that are on the tangent. So remember the gradient is equal to, gradient m is equal to rise over run. So let's look at our points. Let's look at, first of all, the run. Well, we're going from this point across, all the way across, to four seconds. So the run would be four seconds. We're going four across. And in terms of the rise, well, we're going down here. The graph's actually going downwards. So it's going to have a negative rise because it's going downwards. And it's going down from 13.6 to 9.6. So it's going down by four. So that means our rise is negative four because it's going down by four. So the gradient is equal to the rise, well, that's negative four, divided by the run, which is four, and negative four divided by four would be minus one. So that means that the gradient of this tangent is negative one. That means the gradient of the curve at that particular moment is negative one also. And the question wants us to find the rate of change of the depth of water. So it's going to be negative one centimeters per second. So the rate of change of the depth of water at 2.5 seconds is negative one centimeters per second. So in other words, the container is decreasing by height at one centimeter every second at that particular moment. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic we're going to look at is the equation of a circle. That's video 12. And here we've got the Corp Miles revision card. And the equation of a circle at GCSE level is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Where the center of the circle is always the origin at GCSE level. That's the point zero, zero. So the circle will always have a center of zero, zero. And the radius of the circle is r. So this r is equal to the radius. So if you have a look at this circle, the center of the circle is the origin. So that means it'll be in the form x squared plus y squared, its equation. And it will be equal to, well, its radius is equal to 4, so 4 squared is 16. So the equation of this circle would be x squared plus y squared equals 16. And if we were to look at the revision card, that's what this says. It says it's got a center of 0, 0. And since 4 squared is equal to 16, the radius is 4. So that's it. So that's the equation of a circle. This is the core mass revision card. If you are interested in those, then the link below, and they're really, really useful. And this is one of the revision cards. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our last topic. So the last MA topic we're going to look at is the equation of a tangent to a circle. And that's video 372 in corporate maths. So here we've got a circle, and there's a tangent to that circle, and it's a tangent at the point 26. And the question says, the diagram shows the circle x squared plus y squared equals 40. So it's a circle with a center of the origin, and it's equal to 40. Let's just check, 2 squared is 4, 6 squared is 36, 4 plus 36 is 40. Yep, that's a point on the circle. And we're trying to find the equation of the tangent at that point 26. So we've got the point 26, and this is a tangent, and we're going to find the equation of that tangent. So let's find the equation of that tangent. So first of all, we know it's a straight line. So we know the tangent will be in the form y equals mx plus c. So we need to find m, the gradient of this tangent, and we also need to find c, where this tangent will meet the y-axis, so this point here. And if we know the gradient of this line, and if we know where the line crosses the y-axis, we will be able to find its equation. So first of all, let's find the gradient of this tangent. Now here we've got the radius of the circle. So this is the radius of the circle. Now thinking back to our circle theorems, a radius and a tangent always meet at 90 degrees, so that is a right angle. And because that's a right angle, that means that the tangent and the radius are perpendicular to each other. So that means if we know the gradient of the radius, we can then find the negative reciprocal, and that will be the gradient of the tangent. So let's first of all find the gradient of the radius. So here we've got a radius, and it's going, let's change color of pen to blue, so it just stands out a bit more. So here we've got the point zero, zero, and here we've got the point two, six. So let's find the gradient of this radius here. So it's rise over run, so let's turn it into a right angle triangle. So we've got rise over run, and it's run, where we're going from zero across to two, so it's run as two, and it's rise, well, we're going from zero up to six, so it's rise is six. So that means the gradient of this radius will be m equals rise, which is six, divided by run, which is two, which would be equal to three. So the gradient of this radius is equal to three. Now, the tangent is perpendicular to it. That means that its gradient is the negative reciprocal. So that means that our gradient of our tangent will be the negative reciprocal of three. So that means it would be, well, the reciprocal of three is a third, and the negative reciprocal would be minus a third. So that means that for our tangent, it'll be y equals negative a third x plus c. And if we can now just find its y-intercept, this point c, where it crosses the y-axis, we can then find out its equation. All we need to know is one point that that line passes through, and then we can find this plus c. Well, that's great, because we know that it passes through the point two six. So we know a point on the line, so if we substitute in our values for x and y, so x equals two and y equals six, if we substitute those into our equation, y equals minus a third x plus c, we can then find our plus c. So let's substitute those in. So y is equal to six, so we're gonna get six equals 
Then we've got negative a third x. Well, x is 2, so that means negative a third times 2. And then we've got r plus c. Now, negative a third times 2. Well, a third times 2 is 2 thirds. Negative a third times 2 would be negative 2 thirds. So we've got 6 equals negative 2 thirds plus c. Now, we want to get c on its own, so we don't want this negative 2 thirds here. So let's add 2 thirds to both sides. So 6 add 2 thirds would be 6 and 2 thirds. And then on the right-hand side, we added 2 thirds to get rid of the 2 thirds, and then we'll just be left with c. So that's it. We've got our y-intercept. This point here is 6, 2 thirds, or 6.66666 reoccurring. So that's it. So we have found our y-intercept, and we know the gradient of the tangent is equal to negative a third. So that means that the equation of this tangent will be y equals negative a third x plus 6 and 2 thirds. Alternatively, this could be written as a top-heavy fraction. We could have written y equals negative a third x plus, and 6 times 3 is equal to 18, plus 2 is 20 over 3, and either of these would be acceptable. So this is the equation of the tangent. The equation of the tangent, I really like this topic because you put several topics together. We use the equation of a circle, we can work out the gradients of lines, we consider the circle theorem, so the radius and the tangent meet at 90 degrees, we look at the gradient of perpendicular lines being the negative reciprocal and things like that, and you just put them all together and it's just a, it's a great topic. <laughs> okay, so I really hope you find this video useful. This has been the M8 topics of the CAGCSE Maths course. So in red, we've got the number topics. In green, we've got the geometry of the shape, space, and measure topics. We've gone through the topics in orange, that's the statistics and probability topics. And in blue, we've gone through the algebra topics. So we've spent about five minutes in each of those topics today. Also, really make sure you're confident with the M7, M6, and M5 material. And also just recap your M4, M3, M2, and M1 material just to make sure you're confident with those. In the description below, you'll find the videos to each of these, the revision checklist for each of these can be found in Corp Maps as well. This revision checklist is going to be really useful for you, so print it out, stick it on your wall, bring it on the bus to school with you, make sure you just you know it, and you, if you need any help in any of these topics as you go through M8, these video numbers will help you. Also remember, there was an accompanying booklet with this video, the Ultimate C M8 Revision Question Booklet, <laughs> catchy title I know, but that booklet had a question on every single one of those topics as we went through it, so if you try those questions, um, that's going to be really useful for you, and remember the answers are there as well. Also, the revision cards, we used several of these revision cards as we went through the videos, the M8, M7, and so on videos. For M8, obviously, you're going to want the higher revision cards, and if you do want those, then the link below. And also, that little and often approach to revision can be really useful. So the higher five a days, those green ones, and the blue higher plus five a days will be very useful for you for M8. Okay, so I really, really hope you find this video useful. We've spent about five or so minutes in each of the topics. The idea of it is to just make sure you're familiar with those topics to sort of go alongside all the revision you're doing. I really, really hope you find this video useful. If you have found it useful, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please like the video, and all the very best of luck with your M8 studies. Okay, good luck.